Remember how often you've heard about the magic of closing a sale? How closing is the big step in the sales process? How using the right sales gimmicks or tricks can help you close? No matter how many times we've heard those things about closing, many of us still think that closing is a matter of luck or that it's a special skill that just some people are born with. Or we think things like, the good closer gets all the breaks. Or even that closing really is magic. <laughs> Let me put all that foolishness to rest. There's nothing magical at all about closing a sale. Any good closer will tell you that. Okay, uh, let's kill the lights. And can we stop the effects track? Okay. There's no more magic in closing than there is magic in magic. Unless, of course, you believe in magic. And I don't. Let's take a close look at the clever tricks you've just been watching. A magic act depends on how well the magician uses four main powers or skills. He uses speed of movement, position of his hands and body, objects that can be easily concealed, and diversion, so you don't pay close attention to what's actually going on. When you take a magic trick apart and look at it, there's no magic at all. It's a carefully designed and executed performance. The similarity between magic and closing is that both are carefully designed and executed performances. Like magic, closing employs several powerful elements, five to be exact. Let's take an overview of a car sale. The five powers flow one to the other from the time the prospect walks into the showroom through to the time he puts his okay on the deal. The first closing power you have up your sleeve is knowledge. Knowledge of the product and knowledge of the prospect. Any salesperson realizes he's got to get to know the prospect, his wants, his needs, his fears. Now, let me be absolutely sure I know what you're looking for then. Mm -hmm. You certainly don't want another wagon, is that right? <laughs> right, now that the kids are gone. But you want an automatic transmission? Yeah. An engine with good power? Sure. And good gas mileage. <laughs> Who doesn't these days? You're, you're right. That means you want a midsize or maybe even a compact model. Right. But uh, nothing smaller than that. Okay, then let's check out a couple of good examples of just what you're looking for. Okay. Your second closing power is the power of value. Good, solid value for the dollar. The power of value in the hands of a successful salesperson builds the wants and desires of a prospect into needs throughout the sale. That's what's meant by closing on the deal from the very beginning, one piece at a time. You know, this car you're showing me has those expensive tires. You sure they're worth the difference in price? Oh, I think so. I use them. For one thing, they give better traction, which is safer no matter what the weather is. And they give better gas mileage. Yeah, I read that someplace two more miles to the gallon on the highway. They can repay their costs pretty quick, depending on how much you drive. Mm. The price differential amounts to only pennies a day. Small price to pay for all that, isn't it? Yeah, you're probably right. Your third major closing power is the power of legitimacy. You follow the dealership's procedures and paperwork guidelines, and that builds an image of you in the prospect's mind an image that you are a professional, a businessman. You use business-like techniques to conduct your business. You have product manuals and catalogs at your disposal, and you use them to help answer questions. When you get around to writing the deal, the paperwork is complete. You write things down, figure things out. All important information is on paper, including the appraisal on the trade, if there is a trade-in. How much you give me for my 75 wagon? The uh, blue wagon next to the flagpole? Yeah, that's the one. Body's in great shape. Runs good. You know, it's spotless inside. Okay, why don't you give me the keys to your car and I'll ask our appraiser to look it over and give us a complete appraisal. A good clean trade like yours will help you get a good deal. 
Your fourth power is the power of authority, backing yourself up with the authority of the dealership and its management. Your own authority and credibility should be firmly established prior to the closing. By now, you've displayed your power of knowledge, your power of value, and your power of legitimacy. At closing time, the prospect should have few doubts about you or the product. Now he has to have that image reinforced. If you pretend to be the final authority, he'll test you in the eventual negotiating process. So establish other authorities who will back you up, the manager or dealer. Okay, Mr. Simpson, here's the appraiser's written offer on your deal. Gee, I was hoping for a little more than that. Well, we can talk with my manager about it, but uh, Bill doesn't miss very much. I've worked with a lot of appraisers, and he's one of the best. Let's see, uh, a few places need some paint touch-up. Uh, a few other items, otherwise it's pretty clean. The only big item is a leak in the cooling system. Gee, I've never had any trouble with a cooling system before. Well, that's good, but your car's dripping something from someplace and it should be fixed before it gets worse. Now, these are things we have to fix before we can put the car in our lot. I'll tell you what. Let me take the appraisal and your paperwork into my manager so that he can take a look at it, and I'll be right back with Your fifth closing power is the power of assurance. Assurance that the prospect is getting what he wants and needs. That assurance in the prospect's mind is planted by you throughout the entire transaction, and it grows to the point that he decides he's going to buy from you. It's the power of assurance in the prospect's mind that makes him say to himself, take the deal. And it's your reassurance all along the way that convinces him he's making the right decision. That's right. Steel radials, uh, premium sound system, the six with air conditioning, it's all there. Just the car you had in mind, isn't it? Yeah, pretty close. Well, I knew you'd think it was a great package, Mr. Simpson. It should provide everything you need in the car. You know, I like dealing with somebody who knows what he wants. Let's figure that up. These five sales powers are the basic components of closing. There's nothing magical about any of them. They're what every good salesperson does in every deal. When you get these ideas into the prospect's mind, he takes on a very positive attitude toward buying. And that's what closing is all about. Your power of knowledge, your power of value, your power of legitimacy, your power of authority, and your power of assurance. So, when do we talk about closing? Well, we just did. Closing starts when the prospect walks in the door. These powers will help you close only if they're used throughout the sales process, from start to finish. The key to the effective close is that your power is already established before you go into the closing room. Every prospect is looking for this kind of support as he makes his buying decision. Let's talk for just a minute about the same thing in just a little different way. Closing is nothing more than agreement, and agreement is based on negotiation. Negotiation is the result of communication. Communication doesn't happen without conversation. Conversation means asking and listening, and Asking and listening leads to understanding. And that's what's absolutely necessary to reach a successful close. If you understand the prospect and he understands you, his closing time objections will be fewer, easier to handle, and you'll have the final agreement all ready to go when you walk into the closing room. Let's take still another look at our salesman, Hank Dawson, and his prospect, Mr. Simpson. Let's watch how Hank gains an understanding of Mr. Simpson's needs. And let's see how Hank helps plant his five powers in Mr. Simpson's mind, which more than likely will lead to Mr. Simpson's decision to buy. What can we do for you today? Well, I read your ad, and I came over to see if your hot deals are for real. Uh, this guy's defensive and uncomfortable. 
He's afraid, but he doesn't want to show it. Uh, let's see if I can help him relax. Hey, you bet they're real. I'm sure I can show you some great cars and some sensational savings. You came to the right place. Well, it better be a hot deal or no deal at all. Hank may be right. When a customer comes in looking for a red-hot deal, he's probably unsure of himself. If you become defensive in return, you'll get nowhere. Hank knows that what Simpson needs is the power of assurance. Oh, you bet they're real. I'm sure I can show you some great cars and some sensational savings. You came to the right place. It's as if Hank really said, this is where people come when they want a good deal. We have cars and prices of all sorts. And it's okay to want a hot deal, Mr. Simpson. I'll do my best to help you get one. Let's get back to the sale. Listen to some of the things Hank says to trigger the powers in Mr. Simpson's mind. Well, the way I look at it, buying a car is a big investment. Oh, you're right. And there's no better time to make that investment either. Cars keep getting better, and we're trading as close as possible these days. And it's got to be the right car, too. You know, my kids are grown up now. And I've got more car than I need for my wife and me. Well, you know, a majority of the people I've dealt with lately are looking for the same thing. Uh, what kind of car are you driving now? Well, I've got a big wagon. Nice car, but when you don't need it. Well, we still sell quite a few of them, but my stock sheet shows that the trend is down. Mm. But we've got a good inventory in the range you're looking for. Well, let's take a look at a few. Not anything too fancy now. Okay, so for what, uh, from what I gather, you don't want another full-size wagon. Mm. Does that mean you'd rule out a mid-size or a compact, too? Now the salesman and prospect move into the active selection of the car. They rule out the wagon and settle on a mid-sized sedan. They're just beginning to look at it closely. Listen to Hank close while he presents the car. Now, even though this is a mid-size, it's a good-sized sedan. Six-cylinder engine. Torque flight transmission for good mileage. And good performance, too. Air conditioning also. Are we on target? Yes, definitely. But I don't want the price to get away from me. Oh, it won't. And, uh, by the way, how about a good stereo sound system that I know you enjoy? Right. But how'd you know that? Well, I saw the good stereo system in your other car. Good for you. Yeah, that's right, but uh, I'm afraid of what all that adds up to on the price. Believe me, it shouldn't bother you at all. A good stereo system is going to cost a little more but it's definitely worth it, don't you think? As the sale continues, note how the salesman is preparing for the close all along the way. Of course, the customer may still object when he sees the sales agreement, but his objections will be fewer and easier to handle. The salesman is establishing preliminary agreements all along the way, and he's understanding his customer. He's building the important sense of knowledge, value, and assurance in his prospect's mind. With this kind of approach, the salesman is actually closing the car a piece at a time. If he continues this way, he'll eventually have it all agreed to. Style, color, interior, tires, and all the other possible options. If you've done as good a job as this salesman has, there's no need for a hard close. You need only to make sure that the features the prospect wants are available, understood, and agreed to verbally. The next step is to demonstrate the product on the road. Uh, that's closing, too. Let the prospect touch, smell, feel, and drive the product while you continue to ask checking questions about each benefit demonstration you use. And as you do that, you're closer and closer to the traditional closing. Back at the dealership, after your demonstration drive, the process now involves getting down on paper all the pieces of the car you've sold. Okay, let's put everything we've talked about on paper. <laughs> not so fast. I haven't decided to buy. Don't write an order. Well, I'm not writing an order. 
just a worksheet, just to give you a clear picture of the deal. Well, okay, let's see. The manager's stock and price, and the used car manager's appraisal, four-door, six-cylinder, air conditioning. What happens in the closing room is like the final move of the magician's act. It's here where the performance pays off. But notice how the salesman continues to use his closing power, the power of legitimacy and the power of authority. Here's where you ask for the order, and here's where you get the order. Sometimes, yes, sometimes you have to cope with two very difficult prospect habits. His habit of finding something wrong with the deal, or his habit of postponing the decision. Well, it's a nice car. But it doesn't have a, boy, that's a whole lot more money than I thought it would be. Appreciate your help, but uh, better talk it over with my wife. I tell you, suppose I come by later in the week. Uh, I got a lot of errands to run this afternoon and I'm overdue now. What you've just heard are objections and stalls. Let's talk about why prospects do this and we'll get into how to handle the objections. Objections don't come out of the blue. There's usually a reason behind the objection. In some cases, it's justified. In some cases, it's not. In all cases, you're dealing with emotions. And in all cases, you have to deal with the problems properly. One reason for an objection is fear. That's usually the case when the prospect objects about price. He's afraid of himself. And he's afraid of you, afraid you're going to take him for a bundle. Another reason for an objection is bad information. He's confused about something. In the case of prices, he's heard too many figures and he can't keep them straight. In the case of product details, he hasn't listened to your presentation carefully enough or you haven't explained something. Still another reason for an objection is habit. He's not sure he wants or needs this or that item on the new car because he's never had one before, or he's always bought another make, not yours. When handling an objection in the closing room, here's the first piece of advice every salesman has to have. Don't argue. The second piece of advice, calm him down. Watch and listen to this. That's a lousy price. I told you I was looking for a good deal. I don't call that a good deal. Do you feel that's more than you wanted to spend? Well, you better believe it. You're going to have to trim that a whole lot before you trade with me. Well, I don't blame you for wanting the best deal you can get. If I were in your shoes, I'd certainly want to do the best I could. How much too high do you think the price is? You've just seen the first five steps in the objection handling process. The first step is listen, then pause. Next, restate the objection. You'll notice the salesman then did two important things together. He agreed with the prospect's concern, and he asked the prospect to explain the objection further. So far, the effort has been aimed at two things, cooling down the emotions and getting a better handle on the problem. Let's continue with the negotiations. Well, I'd say you're five or six hundred dollars high. I mean, that would make my monthly payment a lot more than I'm paying now. Yeah, and we didn't want to do that, did we? Oh. Maybe we should have taken a closer look at the other sedan. You know, the one without the uh, stereo system. No, I want that. It's just that it's the wrong price. Maybe I should have quoted you on a longer payment program. Uh, that way, your monthly payments would have been brought down considerably. I don't want that either. It's just that you're too high priced. The salesman has done several more important things in this negotiation. He has taken the blame for not explaining things better, while at the same time, he's offered some alternatives. Notice, however, that he hasn't offered the real alternative the prospect wants, a price concession. And notice something else. He's now more certain than ever that the prospect wants the car, this car, with this equipment. Let's go back to the closing room where you'll notice the salesman will stay on top of the negotiating procedure. He will not make any concession 
before he attempts to resell value and unless he gets some kind of commitment from the prospect. I don't want that either. You're just too high priced. I don't blame you for not wanting to spend more than you originally had in mind, but you did pick out a very well equipped car. One you'll enjoy for a long time to come. And as I said, uh, when you first came in, we're offering some very fine deals this week. Here are two other steps in the objection handling process. Saving face for the prospect, that is giving him all the emotional cool off possible, and restating your own position by listing again some of the values involved. Remember, the salesmen who offer quick price concessions are targets for a second or third push. If you have negotiating room, reserve it for a little later. Let's go back to the closing room. And you do agree that this is the car. If I can get my manager to improve that deal a little, you say you'd be in a position to trade today? If we can get the right deal, yes. As I said before, you've got to trim that price. What the salesman has done here is what is most important of all, get a commitment. There's no sense in even attempting a concession that will result in no decision. And notice something else. He didn't offer to make a price concession. He simply said, if I can get my manager to improve that deal. That takes us back to the beginning of our discussion and the use of the power of authority. This takes the salesman out of the argument and puts him on the prospect's side. But most important of all, it tells the prospect that he's now dealing at the highest, most official level. This brings up another important step in the negotiating process. In most dealerships, it's a mandatory step if the close runs into a snag. It's called the turnover. Let's take a look at it. Mr. Simpson, we're right on the edge of getting you the best deal possible. Now, I want you to be completely satisfied. So I think it would be best for you to talk to our manager, Mr. Lewis. Let me call him in. It's as simple as that. Well, it's nice to be able to close on your own, but when a turnover will make it certain, use it. After all, even magicians have assistants. Finally, let's look at the situation where you have agreed on everything, except you don't have a signature on the order. Remember the power of assurance? Well, here's where it comes into play again. One thing you can be sure of, you'll never get a signed order unless you do certain things. Have an order to sign. Have the deal on paper so the prospect can put his name on something official. It's an illustration of the power of legitimacy. Put the order in front of the prospect as though you really expect him to sign it. Again, the power of assurance. And don't ask for a signature, ask for an approval. Let's take a look at how easily our salesman does it. Well, you certainly picked a fine car, Mr. Simpson, at a fine price. I'll need your approval so that we can get this order going. Or it might sound like this. Would you like to take delivery on this tomorrow afternoon or would Thursday be better? I'll need your approval so that we can have plenty of time to... But suppose the prospect says something like this. Well, that uh, looks pretty good to me, but I really hadn't expected to buy this soon. Uh, I think I better talk it over with my wife. Sure. You want to call her from here? No, no, I think I better bring her in. Well, that's okay, because we're open this evening. I'm sure she'll like it. Why not approve this order so that we can hold the car, and then we'll have all the paperwork ready when you come in? Most closing room failures can be attributed to a salesman's hesitation to ask for an approval on the order. And that's unfortunate. Your prospect came into the dealership because he or she wanted to buy a car. You've done all kinds of helpful, persuasive things in the process of selling. You're in the closing room where the deal is being finalized. The prospect expects to be asked. So, ask him. Tell you what. Hank, would you come in here a minute? Let's just sit down and talk about some of the aspects that we've discussed in this program. Uh, for example, give me some of your ideas on power. I work from a position of power. I know about cars and I know about people. 
I know, though, when a prospect walks in that front door that he's looking for a car. I also know that he wouldn't have come here to look if he didn't think he could find a product or a deal that would satisfy him. But how far does this power concept really take you? My power becomes his persuasion. He'll buy only if he really wants to buy. But I have to make it easy for him to do it. Everything I do, from the minute I meet him to the minute he leaves, is aimed at getting agreement. Can you tell me a little bit about your uh, techniques? We talk, exchange points of view. I get a chance to show the product and explain it to him. Now, we've talked a lot about value. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? I make it a point to show him how the features of the car are worth something to him. I let him prove it to himself, too, with a demonstration drive. Remember when we mentioned the issues of legitimacy and authority? How do you combine those things and make them real to a customer? Well, I treat everything on a business-like basis. Trade and allowance, car prices, comparative information. I want my prospect to know that he's doing business with a businessman. And I use management backup in my conversation and in my negotiating. My prospect knows that he's getting top-level treatment because I'm using top-level resources. All those things are really interesting and really helpful. But you're talking about a big-ticket purchase here. Now, how do you keep the customer's confidence? Well, I keep things on a positive basis. I ask checking questions and answer objections. I drop in notes of approval and encouragement as often as possible. And when we walk into the closing room, my job is more than half finished. My selling power has become the prospect's power of conviction that what he's about to do is right. And when we walk out of the closing room, more times than not, I have a signed order and a down payment, and he has himself a new car. Some very helpful insights. Hank, I want to thank you an awful lot. Okay, appreciate it. Well, there you have it. A close look at what it takes to make an effective close. To be sure, there's a lot more that could be said on the subject. But if you use these essentials, you'll build your own closing style. If this short period of instruction has done nothing else but to give you a track to run on and a sense of self-assurance, then it's done its work. The only thing left for you is to put it to the test. Try it. Okay, let's have the lights up. And let's stand by on the effects track. We started with our magician, so let's close with him. I think you'll agree that what he does and what you do in the closing room have a lot in common. There's no magic in magic. And there's no magic in closing. Just well-executed performances by carefully practiced professionals. And the more you practice, the better the performance gets. Don't knock yourself out pulling rabbits out of hats. Spend your time pulling good deals out of prospects. You can do it. That's the end of the tape, but not the end of the program. With this tape is a workbook, which gives you some review information. Please take a few minutes to read it and answer the brief quizzes. Then perhaps you'll want to see the tape again to confirm what you've learned. When you have completed the quiz questions, turn them into your manager. He'll see to it that the completion statement is filled in and return to the sales training department in Detroit. In about two weeks, you'll get a certificate showing that you've completed the course. We hope you have found this program interesting, but most important, we hope you find that when you apply the ideas we've talked about, you'll close a bigger percentage of deals than ever before.